and their readers who helped provide some of the questions and topics that we'll be addressing tonight. The rules tonight, by the way, are simple. 90 seconds for answers, 30 seconds for follow-ups and rebuttals. And with that, that's it. We're going to begin um, with 60-second opening statements from each of the candidates. And as agreed to in advance by the two campaigns, we are going to begin tonight with Senator Sanders. Well, Rachel, thank you very much. <clears throat> Millions of Americans are giving up on the political process. And they're giving up on the political process because they understand the economy is rigged. They are working longer hours for low wages. They're worried about the future of their kids. And yet, almost all new income and wealth is going to the top 1%. Not what America is supposed to be about. Not the fairness that we grew up believing that America was about. And then sustaining that rigged economy is a corrupt campaign finance system undermining American democracy, where billionaires, Wall Street, corporate America, can contribute unlimited sums of money into super PACs and into candidates. Our job together is to end a rigged economy, create an economy that works for all, and absolutely overturn Citizens United, one person, one vote. That's what American democracy is about. Thank you, Senator. Secretary Clinton. Well, I'm happy to be here in New Hampshire for this debate as we move toward the primary on Tuesday. I believe that America has the opportunity to once again live by our values, live up to our values in the 21st century. But I think that America can only do that if Americans can succeed. And there are lots of reasons why Americans today are feeling left out and left behind. Yes, of course, the economy has not been working for most Americans. Yes, of course, we have special interests that are unfortunately doing too much to rig the game. But there's also the continuing challenges of racism, of sexism, of discrimination against the LGBT community, of the way that we treat people as opposed to how we want to be treated. I believe that we can get back on the right track, that I want to imagine a country where people's wages reflect their hard work, where we have health care for everyone and where every child gets to live up to his or her potential. I'm fighting for people who cannot wait for those changes, and I'm not making promises that I cannot keep. All right. Well, let's get started. Secretary Clinton, last night you cited the Concord Monitor when you said of Senator Sanders that, quote, it's very hard to see how any of his proposals could ever be achievable. So please tell us why uh, you think if he's elected president on a platform of promising things like free public college and universal health care that he cannot achieve those things. Well, let me start by saying that Senator Sanders and I share some very big progressive goals. I've been fighting for universal health care for many years and we're now on the path to achieving it. I don't want us to start over again. I think that would be a great mistake to once again plunge our country into a contentious debate about whether we should have and what kind of system we should have for health care. I want to build on the progress we've made, go from 90 percent coverage to 100 percent coverage. And I don't want to rip away the security that people finally have. 18 million people now have health care. Pre-existing conditions are no longer a bar. So we have a difference. I also believe in affordable college, but I don't believe in free college because every expert that I have talked to says, look, how will you ever control the cost? What I want to do is make sure middle class kids, not Donald Trump's kids, get to be able to afford college. I want to get the economy going again. It's not just enough about what we're against, as important as that is. I have a plan to create new jobs, manufacturing, infrastructure, clean energy jobs that will make us the 21st century clean energy superpower. I also want to make sure small businesses can start and grow again. And of course, I believe in raising the minimum wage and equal pay for work. 
But the numbers just don't add up from what Senator Sanders has been proposing. That's why all of the independent experts, all of the editorial boards that have vetted both of us have concluded that it is just not achievable. Let's go down a path where we can actually tell people what we will do. A progressive is someone who makes progress. That's what Thank I you. intend to do. Thank you, Secretary. Senator Sanders, so just explain how you've spent okay. nearly two decades in Congress and haven't gotten any of these things passed. Why do you think as president well, you'll be able to achieve big, big new programs? Well, like I haven't this? quite run for president before. Uh, <laughs> you know, let's deal with some of the comments that Secretary Clinton made. And by the way, sec, you know, sometimes there's a lot of drama here. I've known Secretary Clinton for 25 years and respect her very much. Here is the issue. Every major country on earth, whether it's the UK, whether it's France, whether it's Canada, has managed to provide health care to all people as a right, and they are spending significantly less per capita on health care than we are. So I do not accept the belief that the United States of America can't do that. I do not accept the belief that the United States of America and our government can't stand up to the ripoffs of the pharmaceutical industry, which charge us by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Number two, in the economy today, everybody understands that we need a well-educated workforce. This is 2016. When we talk about public education, it can no longer be K through 12th grade. I do believe that public colleges and universities should be tuition free. Well, how do we pay for that? It's an expensive proposition. I do believe that we should substantially lower student debt in this country, which is crushing millions of people. We pay for it, in my view, by a tax on Wall Street speculation. The middle class bailed out Wall Street in their time of need. Now it is Wall Street's time to help the middle class. If I could just follow up on that. There is no disagreement between us on universal coverage for health care. The disagreement is where do we start from and where do we end up? The Republicans want to repeal the Affordable Care Act. I want to improve it. I want to build on it, get the cost down, get prescription drug costs down. Senator Sanders wants us to start all over again. This was a major achievement of President Obama, of our country. It is helping people right now. I am not going to wait and have this plunge back into a contentious national debate that has very little chance of succeeding. Great. Let's make the Affordable Care Act work for everybody. And let me just say this, as Secretary Clinton may know. I am on the Health Education Labor Committee. That committee wrote the Affordable Care Act. The idea that I would dismantle health care in America while we're waiting to pass a Medicare for all is just not accurate. The Affordable Care Act has clearly, as Secretary Clinton made, made the point, done a lot of good things. But what it has not done is dealt with the fact that we have 29 million people today who have zero health insurance, we have even more who are underinsured with large deductibles and co-payments, and it's prescription drug prices are off the wall. So I do believe that in the future, not by dismantling what we have here, I help write that bill, but by moving forward, rallying the American people, right. I do believe we should have health care for all. All right, thank you both, Rachel. Secretary Clinton. Senator Sanders is campaigning against you um, now, at this point in the campaign, basically by arguing that you are not progressive enough to be the Democratic nominee. He has said that if you voted for the Iraq war, if you are in favor of the death penalty, if you wobbled on things like the Keystone Pipeline or TPP, if you said single-payer health care could never happen, then you're too far to the right of the Democratic Party to be the party's standard bearer. Given those policy positions, why should liberal Democrats support you and not Senator Sanders? Well, because I am a progressive who gets things done. And the root of uh, that word, progressive, is progress. But I've, I've heard uh, Senator Sanders' comments, and it's really caused me to wonder, who's left? 
in the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Under his definition, President Obama is not progressive because he took donations from Wall Street. Vice President Biden is not progressive because he supported Keystone. Senator Shaheen is not progressive because she supports the trade pact. Even the late great Senator Paul Wellstone would not fit this definition because he voted for DOMA. You know, we have differences and honestly, I think we should be talking about what we want to do for the country. But if we're going to get into labels, I don't think it was particularly progressive to vote against the Brady Bill five times. I don't think it was progressive to vote to give gun makers and sellers immunity. I don't think it was progressive to vote against Ted Kennedy's immigration reform. So we can go back and forth like this, but the fact is most people watching tonight want to know what we've done and what we will do. That's why I am laying out a specific agenda that will make progress, get more jobs with rising incomes, get us to universal health care coverage, get us to universal pre-K, paid family leave, and the other elements of what I think will build a strong economy that will ensure that Americans keep making progress. That's what I'm offering and that's what I will do as president. Senator Sanders, how do you establish a list of what it means to be a progressive that is unrealistic? No, not at all. Here's the reality of American economic life today. The reality is that we have one of the lowest voter turnouts of any major country on earth because so many people have given up on the political process. The reality is that there has been trillions of dollars of wealth going from the middle class in the last 30 years to the top one-tenth of one percent. The reality is that we have a corrupt campaign finance system which separates the American people's needs and desires from what Congress is doing. So to my mind, what we have got to do is wage a political revolution where millions of people who have given up on the political process stand up and fight back demand a government that represents us and not just a handful of campaign contributions, contributors. Now all of the ideas that I'm talking about, they are not radical ideas. Doing, making public colleges and universities tuition free, that exists in countries all over the world, used to exist in the United States. Rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure and creating 13 million jobs by doing away with tax loopholes that large corporations now enjoy by putting their money into the Cayman Islands and other tax havens, that is not a radical idea. What we need to do is to stand up to the big money interests and the campaign contributors. When we do that, we can in fact transform America. Thank you, Senator. I just want to follow up on, on on a comment that Secretary Clinton said, Senator, you know, President Obama has not called for abolishing the death penalty. President Obama is for the big Asian trade deal known as TPP. And just yesterday you said you can't be both a moderate or a progressive, but you, you can't be both. Is President Obama, in your judgment, based on these policy positions, a progressive? Let me just pick up on this point. This whole discussion began because I commented not make an overall evaluation about the secretary. She was in Ohio, I think in September or November. And she got up and said something like, I have been, I'm paraphrasing, I have been criticized because people think I'm a moderate. Well, I am a moderate. That's where this came from. It wasn't me paraphrasing her, it is what she said. And all that I said is nothing wrong with being a moderate. But you can't be a moderate, you can't be a progressive. In terms of, of President Obama, I think if we remember where this country was seven years ago, 800,000 jobs being lost every month, $1.4 trillion deficit, the world's financial system on the verge of collapse, I think that President Obama, Vice President Biden, and the Democratic leadership in the House and the Senate have done a fantastic job. We are in much better shape today than we were seven years ago, although my Republican colleagues seem to have forgotten where we were seven years ago. That's the fact. But we still have a very long way to go. Do I think President Obama is a progressive? Yeah. I do. I disagree with him on a number of issues, including the trade agreement. 
But, yes, I think he has done an excellent job. Well, Chuck, if, if I could, yeah. you know, in the very first debate, uh, I was asked, am I a moderate or a progressive? And I said, I'm a progressive who likes to get things done. And cherry picking a quote here or there doesn't change my record of having fought for racial justice, having fought for kids' rights, having fought against the kind of inequities that fueled my interest in service in the first place, going back to my days in the Children's Defense Fund. It certainly didn't stop me from taking on the drug companies and the insurance companies before it was called Hillary Care, it was called, oh, I mean, before it was called Obamacare, it was called Hillary Care because we took them on and we weren't successful, but we kept fighting and we got the Children's Health Insurance Program. And every step along the way, I have stood up and fought and have the scars to prove it. So, again, I think it's important that. Look, I understand Senator Sanders is really trying to distinguish himself. I, I understand that. That's what you do in campaigns. Uh, but at the same time, let's not be in, in I think, an unfair way uh, making a, an accusation or making an attack about where I stand and where I've always stood. And it is fair to say, Senator, that in your definition as you being the self-proclaimed gatekeeper for progressivism, I don't know anyone else who fits that definition, but I know a lot of really hard fighting progressives in the Democratic Party who have stood up time and time again against special interests, against the powerful, on behalf of those who are left behind and left out. And that's what we ought to be celebrating. Let's talk about what we would do as president and commander in chief to Let's make work. sure the progress continues into the future. Thirty seconds, then we'll move. We'll move on. That's right. I mean, instead of arguing about definitions, let's well, you, talk about you began it let's yesterday talk about with your what comments. we should do. And one of the things we should do is not only talk the talk but walk the walk. I am very proud to be the only candidate up here who does not have a super PAC, who is not raising huge sums of money from Wall Street or special interest. I am enormously proud. Never believed it would happen that we have raised three and a half million individual contributions averaging $27 a piece. That is what the political revolution means. Thank you. Rachel. Senator Sanders, as a Vermonter, uh, you have almost a home state advantage here in New Hampshire. Uh, but back home across the border, y you also have a long history of running against Democrats as a third party candidate for, for governor, for Senate, for Congress. In, in 1988, your candidacy as a, as a third party candidate arguably cost the Democrats a congressional seat and sent a Republican instead. How can you lead the Democratic Party nationally when you have not been a member of the Democratic Party until very recently? Well, Rachel, actually, that wasn't accurate. In 1988, the Republican did win, I believe, by three points. I came in second. It was 34, 31, I think 19 for the Democrat. In that race, the Democrat was the spoiler, not me. And it is true. <laughs> It is true. It's not, not to be denied. I am the longest serving independent in the history of the United States Congress. People of Vermont sent me to Washington as an independent. That is true. But on the other hand, I have, when I was in the House for 16 years, I caucused with the Democrats. In the Senate for nine years, caucus with the Democrats, of course. And I was elected by the Democrats to be chair of the Veterans Committee uh, two, couple, three years ago, which I'm very proud of, and now am the ranking member on the Budget Committee, leader of the Democrats in opposition to the majority Republicans. I am running for president as a Democrat, and if elected, not only do I hope to bring forth a major change in national priorities, but let me be frank. I do want to see major changes in the Democratic Party. I want to see working people and young people come into the party in a way that doesn't exist now. And you know what? I want a 50-state strategy so the Democratic Party is not just the party of 25 states. Secretary well, Clinton. <laughs> Secretary Clinton, you know, the person who first uh, put out the idea of a 50-state uh, party strategy is former Governor Howard Dean, who's with us tonight. And I am uh, I'm very...
proud and grateful to have the support of so many elected Vermonters and former officials. Three, two former governors, the current governor, the current other senator. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I think it's because they've worked with me. They've seen what I do. They know what a kind of a colleague I am. They want me as their partner in the White House. And that's exactly what I will do. We'll get things done together. Democrats, Republicans, independents, we're going to make progress together when I'm president. Senator Sanders, to this, to this point. Secretary Clinton is, is raising the issue of endorsements by your home state Democrats. Um, is, she's, she's implying that that's, that says something about the people who know you best. Well, I don't see it quite like that. Uh, I am, How do you see it? I am, will absolutely admit that Secretary Clinton has the support of far more governors, mayors, members of the House. She has the entire establishment, or almost the entire establishment, behind her. That's a fact. I don't deny it. But I am pretty proud that we have over a million people who have contributed to our campaign, averaging 27 bucks a piece, that we have had meetings where 25, 30,000 people have come out, that our campaign is a campaign of the people, by the people, and for the people. So, Rachel, yes. Secretary Clinton does represent the establishment. I represent, I hope, ordinary Americans, and by the way, who are not all that enamored with the establishment, but I am very proud to have people like Keith Ellison and Raul Grijalva in the House, the co-chairman of the House Progressive Caucus. Well, look, Secretary. I've got to just jump in here because, honestly, Senator Sanders is the only person who I think would characterize me uh, a woman running to be the first woman president as exemplifying the establishment. And I've got to tell you that it is, it, 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 it is really quite, uh, it's really quite amusing to me. People support me because they know me, they know my life's work, they have worked with me, and many have also worked with Senator Sanders. And at the end of the day, they endorse me because they know I can get things done. I am not going to make promises I can't keep. I am not going to talk about big ideas like single payer and then not level with people about how much it will cost. A respected health economist said that these plans would cost a trillion dollars more a year. I'm not going to tell people that I will raise your incomes and not your taxes and not mean it because I don't want to see the kind of struggle that the middle class is going through exemplified by these promises that would raise taxes and make it much more difficult for many, many Americans to get ahead and stay ahead. That is not my agenda. Senator Sanders, you have 30 seconds to respond to that. What being part of the establishment is, is in the last quarter having a super PAC that raised $15 million from Wall Street, that throughout one's life raised a whole lot of money from the drug companies and other special interests. To my mind, if we do not get a handle on money in politics and the degree to which big money controls the political process in this country, Nobody is going to bring about the changes that is needed in this country for the middle class and working families. Yeah, but I, I think it's, it's fair to really ask what's behind that comment. You know, Senator Sanders has said he wants to run a positive campaign. I've tried to keep uh, my disagreements over issues, as it should be. But time and time again, by innuendo, by insinuation, there is this attack that he is putting forth, which really comes down to, you know, anybody who ever took donations or speaking fees from any interest group uh, has to be bought. And I just absolutely reject that, Senator. And I really don't think these kinds of attacks by insinuation are worthy of you. And enough is enough. If you've got something to say, say it directly. 
But you will not find that I ever changed a view or a vote because of any donation that I ever received. What? And I have stood up and I have represented my constituents to the best of my ability, and I'm very proud of that. You know, so I think it's time okay. to end the very artful smear that you and your campaign oh, have been carrying on. out in recent weeks. And let's talk, let's talk about the issues. Let's talk let's about talk the about, issues that divide us. Okay, let's and let's, let let's, us talk we about both issues. agree with campaign finance reform. Let's talk I, about issues. I worked hard for McCain-Feingold. I want to reverse Citizens let's, United. Let's, let's talk about and so issues. Let's, let's talk, talk about issues. Let's talk about issues. All right, let's talk about why in the 1990s Wall Street got deregulated. Did it have anything to do with the fact that Wall Street provided, spent billions of dollars on lobbying and campaign contributions? Well, some people might think, yeah, that had some influence. Let's ask why it is that we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs and your medicine can be doubled tomorrow and there's nothing that the government can do to stop it. You think it has anything to do with the huge amounts of campaign contributions and lobbying for the fossil fuel industry? Let's talk about climate change. Do you think there is a reason why not one Republican has the guts to recognize that climate change is real and that we need to transform our energy system? Do you think it has anything to do with the Koch brothers and ExxonMobil pouring huge amounts of money into the political system? That is what goes on in America. I am not, I like... You know, there is a reason why these people are putting huge amounts of money into our political system. And in my view, it is undermining American democracy and it is allowing Congress to represent wealthy campaign contributors and not the working families of this country. Well, you know, Senator, I don't think... I don't think... I don't think you can find any person in political life today who has been subjected to more attacks and had more money spent against her by special interests, among whom you have named a few, than I. And I'm proud of that. You know, when I took on the drug companies and the insurance companies for universal health care coverage, they went after me with a vengeance. Today, you've got hedge fund billionaires aligned with Karl Rove running ads against me to try to get Democrats to vote for you. I know this game. I'm going to stop this game. But while we're talking about votes, you're the one who voted to deregulate swaps and derivatives in 2000, which contributed to the over-leveraging of Lehman Brothers, which was one of the culprits that brought down the economy. So I don't know. I don't, I'm not impugning your motive because you voted to deregulate swaps and derivatives. People make mistakes. And I'm no. certainly not saying you right. did it for any right. kind of financial advantage. What, what we've got you to do as think. Democrats, what we've got to do as Democrats is to be united to actually solve these problems and what I believe is that I have a better track record and a better opportunity to actually get that job done. That's well, what this election should be about. Go ahead, go ahead, 30, 30 seconds and then we're going to move on. I think as Secretary Clinton knows, there is nobody who fought hard. I, I was on the House Financial Committee at that point. I heard the arguments coming from Democrats and Republicans, Robert Rubin, Alan Greenspan, about how great an idea it would be if we did away with Glass-Steagall and if we allowed investor banks and commercial banks and big insurance companies to merge. Go to YouTube today, look up Greenspan Sanders. Listen to what I told them then. I helped lead the effort against deregulation Unfortunately, we lost that. The result is, was the worst financial disaster since the Great Depression. Thank you both. Senator Sanders, Secretary Clinton, <laughs> obviously we've touched a nerve. We're going to be back with more on this subject and much more right after this. Stay with us. Okay. All right, welcome back. Let's get right to it. Senator Sanders, uh, you were talking about all of your campaign contributions and campaign finance reform. You rail against big money in politics. 
But do you realize there is one public financing system that we do have in place, and it is, it is in place to run for president? Why aren't you walking the walk on that? Why aren't you participating in the presidential public financing system, which is designed to essentially keep big money out of presidential politics? Chuck, actually, we looked at it, but it turns out to be a disaster. The way it is structured right now, uh, if you make it all the way to California, you could do pretty well. Uh, but in terms of the early states, Iowa and New Hampshire, the other states, it just doesn't work. But your point is well taken. I believe in public funding of elections, absolutely. But this system is, I don't know if the secretary would agree, is currently very antiquated and no longer applies to modern day politics. Well, uh, going on that, then why um, criticize her on super PACs and you've got, and all this when it is, you know, that's the system. I mean, you could be participating in a publicly financing no. public financing system but it's a, it's, and being able to set, being able Chuck, to set an example. It's a public financing system that everybody knows is antiquated. It no longer works. Nobody can become president based on that system. So what's the alternative? There are two alternatives. And, uh, you know, we, we looked at it. Well, should we do a super PAC? But I concluded, honestly, I don't represent corporate America or billionaires. I didn't want it. So the other alternative was to ask working families and the middle class to help out in a transformational campaign. And you know what? We got three and a half million individual contributions, 27 bucks a piece. Okay. I think that's pretty good. Secretary Clinton. On the issue of Wall Street. On the issue of Wall Street. When, when our reporters go out and talk to people on the ground in the early states, what they tell us over and over again when they find voters who are leaning towards Senator Sanders rather than yourself is that the most frequent area of concern that they hear from those voters is the issue of, of Wall Street and whether or not you are too close to Wall Street. Last night, um, when you were asked about speaking fees and the amount of speaking fees you got from Goldman Sachs speeches, uh, you said that's what they offered. Have you been too dismissive of voters' concerns about this issue in your own campaign and your own career? Well, you know, Rachel, I think I, I may not have done uh, the job I should in explaining my record. You know, I did when I left the Secretary of State's office, like so many former officials, military leaders, journalists, uh, others. I did go on the speaking circuit. I spoke to uh, heart doctors. I spoke to uh, the American Camping Association. I spoke to auto dealers. And yes, I spoke to firms on Wall Street. They wanted me to talk about the world, what my experience had been as Secretary of State. But what I want people to know is, I went to Wall Street before the crash. I was the one saying, you're going to wreck the economy because of these shenanigans with mortgages. I called to end the carried interest loophole that hedge fund managers enjoy. I proposed changes in CEO compensation. I called for a Consumer Protection Financial Bureau before it was created. And I think the best evidence that the Wall Street people at least know where I stand and where I have always stood is because they are trying to beat me in this primary. They have collected and spent uh, as much as $6 million on these ads. Hedge fund billionaires, Carl Rove, another billionaire jumped in. And why are they doing that? These are guys who try to make smart investments. They know my record, they know me, they know that I say what I believe and I will do it. And I also have a pretty good understanding about how to stop them. So I do want people to know that. And I think it's important for everybody to understand I have a record, I have stood firm, and I will be the person who prevents them from ever wrecking the economy again. Senator Sanders, you have been a critic of Secretary Clinton taking those speaking fees and having uh, donations from Wall Street, what about her defense of her record? Let me just say this. Wall Street is perhaps the most powerful economic and political force in this country. You have companies like Goldman Sachs who just recently paid a settlement fine with the federal government for $5 billion for defrauding investors. Goldman Sachs was one of those companies whose illegal activity helped destroy our economy and ruin the lives of millions of Americans. But this is what a rigged economy and a corrupt campaign finance system 
and a broken criminal justice system is about the, these guys are so powerful that not one of the executives on Wall Street has been charged with anything after paying, in this case of Goldman Sachs, a $5 billion fine. Kid gets caught with marijuana, that kid has a police record. A Wall Street executive destroys the economy, $5 billion settlement with the government, no criminal record. That is what power is about, that is what corruption is about, and that is what has to change in the United States of America. If I could, let me just let me just say that of course it has to change. It has to change, and that's why I have put forward a plan to do just that. And it's been judged to be the toughest, most effective, and comprehensive one. I have great respect for Senator Sanders' commitment to try to restore Glass Steagall, but I do not believe that that is enough. And in fact, I don't believe it really addresses a lot of the biggest issues we have. You know, we now have power under the Dodd-Frank legislation to break up banks, and I've said I will use that power if they pose a systemic risk. But I want to go further, because it was investment banks, it was insurance companies, it was mortgage companies, all of which contributed. So let's not just be narrowly focused on one part of the problem. We have a lot of issues with corporate power that have to be addressed. My plan takes us further, and it would do the job. Well, Secretary Clinton. I would say that... That folks who have looked at this issue for a long time, whether it's Elizabeth Warren or many other economists, would tell you that right now, yes, we do need a 21st century glass legal legislation. And I would tell you also that when you have three out of the four largest banks in America today, bigger than they were, significantly bigger than when we bailed them out because they were too big to fail, I think... If Teddy Roosevelt were alive today, a good Republican, by the way, what he would say is break them up. They are too powerful economically. They are too powerful politically. And that is what I believe and many economists believe. Time to break them up. Look, right. we have a law. Look, you know, I, I appreciate the senator's advocacy. We have a law. It was passed. It was signed by President Obama. It lays out a process that you go through to determine whether a systemic risk is posed. And by the way, President Obama signed that, pushed it through, even though he took donations from Wall Street, because he's a responsible president. So we have a law in place. If the circumstances warrant it, I will certainly use it. And from what you say, I know you will as well. But that is not enough. And I keep going back to this because part of the reason the Wall Street guys are trying so hard to stop me, the hedge fund guys, the shadow banking guys, is because I've got their number on all of that. And my plan goes so much further to try to prevent the problems of the future. You know, we can't just fight the last war. We've got to be prepared to stop these guys if they ever try to use their economic power once again to hurt the economy and to hurt so many Americans. And my plan, Paul Krugman, Barney Frank, a lot of experts who understand what the new challenges might be, have said I am exactly on point, and the Wall Street guys actually know that. So, Senator, okay. in response yeah, to the fact that like she has had more people praise her plan than yours. Well, we've got a number of economists supporting our legislation, uh, and, and here's where we are. The American people can judge. Six largest financial institutions in America today have assets of roughly $10 trillion, 58 equivalent to 58% of the GDP of the United States of America. That is a lot of money. They issue two-thirds of the credit cards, and by the way, they're ripping off a whole lot of people with high interest rates on the credit cards, and they write about one-third of the mortgages. That is a lot of power for six financial institutions. That's it. I think it is too much power. Too much economic right. power, too much political power, okay. and the economists that I talk to say we should break thank, them up. Thank you both. Let me move on to uh, our next question here. And in fact, it comes to us through New England Cable News. Secretary Clinton, it's addressed to you, and it's about this issue of the speeches, uh, particularly to, to Goldman Sachs. This is what the questioner wrote 
uh, verbatim. I am concerned with the abuses of Wall Street as taken with the American taxpayers' money. And then she asked whether you would release the transcripts of your Goldman Sachs speeches and then added, don't you think the voting public has a right to know what was said? But let's make that bigger. Are you willing to release the transcripts of all your paid speeches? We do know through reporting that there were transcription services for all of those paid speeches. In, the, in full disclosure, would you release all of them? I will look into it. I don't know the status, but I will certainly look into it. But I can only repeat what is the fact that I spoke to a lot of different groups with a lot of different constituents, a lot of different kinds of members about issues that had to do with world affairs. I probably described more times than I can remember how stressful it was advising the president about going after bin Laden. Um, so my, my view on this is, look at my record. Look at what I am proposing. And we, don't, we have a vigorous agreement here. We both want to rein in the excesses of Wall Street. I also want to rein in the excesses of companies like Johnson Controls that we bailed out when they were an auto parts company and we saved the auto industry and now they want to avoid paying taxes. I want to go after the pharmaceutical companies like Valiant and, and Turing that are increasing prices uh, without any regard to the impact on people's health. So I have a broader view. Now if, if all we're going to talk about is one part of our economy and indeed one street in our economy, we're missing the big oil companies, we're missing other big energy companies, we're missing the big picture. And I have a record of trying to go at the problems right. that actually exist, and I will continue to do that. Senator, you sound like you want to respond. Go yeah, ahead. I, I do. You know, I, I agree with, with much of what the Secretary said. But, Madam Secretary, it is not one street. Wall Street is an entity of unbelievable economic and political power. Uh, that's a fact. And, and I want to say something, and it may sound harsh, not to you, <laughs> but to the American people in this sense. In my view, the business model of Wall Street is fraud. It's fraud. I believe that corruption is rampant, and the fact that major bank after major bank has reached multi-billion dollar settlements with the United States government, when we have a weak regulatory system, tells me that not only did we have to bail them out once, if we don't start breaking them up, we're going to have to bail them out again, and I do not want to see that happen. Well, well Senator, no one wants to see that happen. I, I mean, look, I... I I care deeply about this because, just like you, I have met so many people who had their life savings wiped out, who lost their homes, who are barely back with their heads above water. This was a disaster for our country, and we can never let that happen again. We have no disagreement about this. But I think it's a broader target list than just Wall Street. Sure. And I believe that we have to be very focused on how we try to take back the power and increase the empowerment of the American people. And I think that I have that kind of experience, maybe because they've beaten me up for so many years, and I know exactly how to handle them right, because I've well, been in the uh, arena with them time and time right, again. Well, let, Senator let, Sanders, let me, yeah. let me turn to, to uh, I think, where this direction is heading anyway, which is the broader issue of big business and power yes. in our political system. You, on the campaign trail, have railed against uh, big-name American corporations like Boeing and General Electric and Walmart. Um, but some big businesses in this country have also been part of advancing progressive goals, like the nationwide initiative to expand employment opportunities for veterans. Uh, that was all about cooperation between the Obama administration and some very big businesses. The Affordable Care Act, some of the thorniest problems in that bill were worked out in cooperation with big business in order to accomplish progressive goals. Could you work with them sure, or sure. have you made enemies of big business in this country with the way you've approached them in this campaign? No, of course I could work with them, but let's be clear, when I talked about Boeing and I talked about General Electric, G General Electric what I was referring to is, is an outrage. I suspect the secretary agrees with me. Right now you have a loophole such that these guys are putting their profits, multi-billion dollar profitable corporations, putting billions of dollars into the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and other tax havens. And in a given year, Rachel, after making billions of dollars in profit, you know how much they're paying in taxes to the United States government in a given year? Zero. 
Now explain to me how that makes any sense at all. So what I have said with regard to Boeing and GE and other multinationals that pay zero taxes, you know what we're going to do? We're going to end that loophole. They are going to pay their fair share of taxes. We're going to use that money to rebuild our infrastructure and create up to 13 million jobs. Can I work with corporations? Are there good corporations? doing incredible cutting edge research and development absolutely they are and we should be proud of them but on the other hand there are many corporations who have turned their backs on the american worker who have said if i can make another nickel in profit by going to china and shutting down in the united states of america that's what i will do I will do my best to transform our trade policy and take on these corporations who want to invest in low-income countries around the world rather than in the United States of America. Senator right. Sanders, thank you. And with that, we are going to be talking about America in the world, both in terms of some trade issues, but also national security. And Secretary Clinton, we're going to start with you. Uh, there are more than 4,000 American troops back in Iraq right now as part of the fight against ISIS. It has been 15 straight years of wars and multiple deployments for America's military families who have borne such a disproportionate burden. Is President Obama right to keep escalating the number of U.S. troops that's fighting ISIS right now? Well, I think uh, what the president uh, understands and what he's trying to do uh, is that we have to support the Arab and Kurdish fighters on the ground who are actually doing the fighting. Uh, I agree with the president. I've said myself, we will not send American combat troops back to either Syria or Iraq. That is off the table. But we do have special forces. We do have trainers. We do have uh, uh, military personnel who are helping with the airstrikes that the United States is leading so that we can try to take out ISIS infrastructure, take out their leadership. Uh, and I think that given the threat that ISIS poses to the region and beyond, as we have sadly seen in our own country, uh, it is important to keep the Iraqi army uh, on a path where they can actually take back territory to work with the uh, Sunni tribes uh, in Anbar province and elsewhere so that their fighters can be also deployed to work with the Kurds to provide them the support. Uh, but they're doing the fighting. We're doing uh, the support and enabling. And I also think we've got to do more to stop foreign fighters, foreign funding, and take ISIS on online, as well as doing everything necessary to keep us safe at home. Uh, so. As I look at what the president is doing, it adds up to me. Uh, we just have to keep trying to get more support for those people on the ground in Syria and Iraq who have to actually physically take the territory back. To be clear, to the specific question, if that strategic goal that you're describing requires considerably more Americans, an ever-increasing number of Americans in Iraq and maybe in Syria, are you okay with the numbers increasing? No. I mean, of course, that's a... Uh, a theoretical question and we don't know what it would be for and we don't know how many numbers there are. I am against American combat troops being in Syria and Iraq. I support special forces. I support trainers. I support the air campaign. And I think we're making some progress. I want to continue to intensify that and that's exactly what the president is doing. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Go ahead, Senator Senator. Okay. Uh, seconds, uh, let me agree with much of what the secretary said. Uh, but where we have a different uh, background on this issue is we differed on the war in Iraq, uh, which created barbaric uh, organizations uh, like ISIS. Uh, not only did I vote against that war, I helped lead the opposition. And if you go to my website, berniesanders.com, you will see uh, the statement that I made in 2002. And it gives me no pleasure to tell you that much of what I feared would happen. Uh, the day after uh, Saddam Hussein was overthrown, uh, in fact, uh, did happen. All right. Senator, I want to stay, if though. Could, if, Go if ahead. I could 30 just seconds. Respectfully add, Secretary. Look, we did differ. A vote in 2002 is not a plan to defeat ISIS. We have to look at the threats that we face right now, and we have to be prepared to take them on and defeat that. Let me, let me, let me, we're, gonna, we're, staying, we're staying basically on this topic. Obviously, you've been emphasizing this difference on the Iraq war, but one place where you do agree and one place where you voted um, to authorize the use of force was in favor of the war in Afghanistan. Yes. Right now, it is possible President Obama is going to be leaving the next president, perhaps President Sanders, at least 10,000 troops in Afghanistan. How long 
Uh, will those troops be in Afghanistan under President Sanders? Well, I think our great task is to make certain that our young men and women in the military do not get sucked into never-ending perpetual warfare within the quagmire of Syria uh, and Iraq. Um, and I will do my very best to make sure that that doesn't uh, happen. Uh, I agree with the secretary that I think what has to happen, and let me just mention what King Abdullah of Jordan said. I, I think he hit the nail on the head. And what he said is essentially the war against ISIS is a war for the soul of Islam. And it must be Muslim troops on the ground that will destroy ISIS with the support of a coalition of major powers, US, UK, France, Germany, and Russia. So our job is to provide them the military equipment that they need, the air support they need, special forces when appropriate. But at the end of the day, for a dozen different reasons, not the least of which is that ISIS would like American combat troops on the ground so they could reach out to the Muslim world and say, look, we're taking on those terrible Americans. The combat on the ground must be done by Muslim troops with our support. We must not get involved in perpetual okay, warfare in the Middle East. Can you address the question on Afghanistan? I mean, that how is long are the these answer. troops going to be there? If President Obama leaves you 10,000 troops, how long? Well, you, you think can't simply be there? withdraw tomorrow. I wish we could, and allow you know uh, the, the Taliban or anybody else to reclaim that country. But what we must do, and and uh, what we have seen in in recent uh, months, is some progress uh, in Iraq, where finally the Iraqi army, which has not been a particularly effective fighting force, retook Ramadi. ISIS has lost, I think, 40% of the territory that it held in the last year. Hopefully, and you know, one can't predict the future, that maybe our training and their fighting capabilities are improving and we are going to make some price progress in destroying ISIS. Secretary Clinton, 30 seconds. How long are these troops going to be in Afghanistan? We well, have more American troops in Afghanistan right now than what we were talking about oh, with Iraq. absolutely. Uh, the president uh, decided to leave more troops than he had originally planned in Afghanistan. Uh, we have a very cooperative government there uh, with uh, uh, Ashraf Ghani and uh, his uh, uh, top uh, uh, his top partner, Abdullah, and they are doing their very best, and the Afghan army is actually fighting. The Afghan army is taking heavy losses defending Afghan territory. And I would have to make an evaluation uh, based on the circumstances at the time I took office as to how much help they continued to need, because it's not just the Taliban. We now are seeing outposts of you know, fighters claiming to be affiliated with ISIS. So we've got this arc of instability from, the, from North Africa to South Asia, and we have to pay close attention to it, and we have to build coalitions, something that I did to take on the Iranian nuclear program and what I will do as president to make sure that we defeat these terrorist networks. You know, Senator Sanders, uh, nobody knows who your foreign policy advisors are. You haven't given a major foreign policy speech, no. and it doesn't sound like all the time that foreign policy is, your, is a priority, other than when you're asked about it, you say you're going to crush ISIS, as you said last night and, and earlier. You have not proactively laid out a foreign policy doctrine yet. Why? No, that's not quite accurate. I did give a speech at Georgetown uh, where I talked about democratic socialism and foreign policy. Maybe I shouldn't have combined the two in the same speech because uh, the foreign policy part of it didn't get much attention. So let me take this opportunity sure. to give you a very Talk short speech here yeah. uh, on the issue. Uh, I think... Uh, while it is true the secretary and I voted differently on the war in Iraq, what is important is that we learn the lesson of the war in Iraq. And that lesson is um, intrinsic to my foreign policy, if elected president, is the United States cannot do it alone. We cannot be the policemen of the world. We are now spending more, I believe, than the next eight countries on defense. We have got to work in strong coalition with the major powers of the world and with those Muslim countries that are prepared to stand up and take on terrorism. So I would say that the key doctrine of the uh, Sanders administration would be, no, we cannot continue to do it alone. We need to work in coalition. Secretary, if I could just add, yes, mm -hmm. 30 seconds, please. 
a group of national security experts, military intelligence experts, issued uh, a very concerning statement about uh, Senator Sanders' views on foreign policy and national security, uh, pointing out some of the comments he has made on these issues, like, such as inviting Iranian troops into Syria to try to resolve the conflict there, putting them right on the doorstep of Israel, uh, asking Saudi Arabia and Iran to work together when they can't stand each other and well. are engaged in a, a proxy battle uh, right at this moment. So I do think questions have been raised and questions have to be answered because when New Hampshire voters go on Tuesday to cast your vote, you are voting both for a president and a commander in chief. And there is no way to predict what comes in the door of that White House from day to day that can pose a threat to the United States or one of our friends and allies. And I think this is a big part of the job interview that we are all conducting with the voters right, here. Senator, three, three, three responses. <laughs> Two responses. I fully, fully concede that Secretary Clinton, who was Secretary of State for four years, has more experience. That is not arguable in foreign affairs. But experience is not the only point. Judgment is. And once again, back in 2002, when we both looked at the same evidence about the wisdom of the war in Iraq, one of us voted the right way and one of us didn't. In terms of Iran and in terms of Saudi Arabia, of course they hate each other. That's no great secret. But John Kerry, who was, I think, doing a very good job, has tried to at least get these people in the room together because both of them are being threatened by ISIS. Well, let me just add that, you know, I've said this before and I'm very proud of it, that when it comes to judgment, uh, having run a hard race against uh, Senator Obama at the time, he turned to me to be Secretary of State. And when it comes to the biggest counterterrorism issues that we faced uh, in this administration, namely whether or not to go after bin Laden, I was at that table. I was exercising my judgment to advise the president what to do on that, on Iran, on Russia, on China, on a whole raft of issues. Because I know from my own experience that you've got to be ready on day one. There is just too much unpredictable threat and danger in the world today, you know, to try to just say, wait, I'll get to that when I can. That is just not well, an well, acceptable Secret no. Secretary Clinton, at the, at the last Democratic debate in Charleston, and I want to get specific here. Senator Sanders called for moving as aggressively as we can to normalize relations with Iran. Your campaign has criticized him for saying that. Now that he's standing next to you here on this stage, can you explain why the U.S. shouldn't try to normalize relations with Iran in your view? Absolutely. You know, I did put together the coalition to impose sanctions. I actually started the negotiations that led to the nuclear agreement, sending some of my closest aides to begin the conversations with the Iranians. I'm very pleased we got that nuclear agreement. It puts a lid on the nuclear weapons program. We have to enforce it. There have to be consequences attached to it. But that is not our only problem with Iran. We have to figure out how to deal with Iran as the principal state sponsor of terrorism in the world. They are destabilizing governments in the region. They continue to support Hezbollah and Hamas in Lebanon against Israel. A lot of the work that we have to do is going to be incredibly hard. I'm prepared to do that work, but I believe, just as I did with imposing the sanctions, you have to get action for action. If we were to normalize relations right now, we would remove one of the biggest pieces of leverage we have to try to influence and change Iranian behavior. The president doesn't think we should. I certainly don't think we should. I believe we have to take this step by step to try to rein in Iranian aggression, their support for terrorism, and the other bad behavior that can come back and haunt Who us. Said that I think we should normalize relations with Iran tomorrow. I never said that. I think we should move forward as quickly as we can. And you're right. 
They are a sponsor of terrorism around the world. And we have to address that. But you know, a number of years ago, people were saying, normal relationship with Cuba? What a bad and silly idea. They're communists, they are our enemy. Well, guess what? Change has come. So please don't suggest that I think we normalize relations uh, with Tehran uh, tomorrow. We don't. But I would like to see us move forward, and hopefully someday that will happen. And I would say, if I might, Madam Secretary, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, when you ran against Senator Obama, you thought him naive, naive, because he thought it was a good idea to talk to our enemies. I think those are exactly the people you have to talk to and you have to negotiate with. Well, Senator, let me just correct the record, if I can. No, let me correct the record. As, um, as, as, I, as I certainly recall, the question was to meet with without conditions. And you're right, I was against that. I was against it then, I would be against it now. Okay. Part of diplomacy, the hard work of diplomacy, is trying to extract whatever concessions you can get in giving something the other side wants. Of course you've got to uh, try to make peace with and work with those who are your adversaries, but you don't just rush in, open the door no. and say, here I am, let's talk and make a deal. No, That's I, I not think, the way it works. I, I think President Obama had the right idea, and, and the bottom line is, that of course there have to be conditions. But of course it doesn't do us any good to not talk with our well, adversaries. Well, we set the conditions on Iran, we worked hard to uh, get them established and to be enforced, and then we talked. Right, that's exactly talk the right and, sequence, and, and just, that's what I did with the president. And so he and I the were record, on the very same page. And just to set the record straight, I very strongly supported uh, the agreement, which makes certain uh, that Iran does not get uh, a nuclear weapon. All right, as Commander-in-Chief Senator Sanders, you've got to prioritize uh, potential threats to the United States. Three countries, North Korea, Iran, Russia. How would you rank them in order of their threat to America's security right now? Starting ISIS. with the biggest threat. ISIS, you forgot I understand one. No, 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 ISIS, ISIS is would we've be... Had, we've had that. I'm talking about these three yeah. countries. How would you orient... How would you orient our uh, national security, our national well, defense clearly posture? clearly North Korea is a very strange situation because it is such an isolated country uh, run by a handful of dictators, or maybe just one, who seems to be somewhat paranoid uh, and who has nuclear weapons. Uh, and our goal there, in my view, is to work and lean strongly on China to put as much pressure, China is one of the few major countries in the world that has significant support for North Korea. And I think we've got to do everything we can to put pressure on China. So I, I worry very much about an isolated, paranoid country uh, with atomic bombs. Uh, I think clearly we have got to work closely with China to resolve mm -hmm. the serious problems we have. And right. I worry about Putin and his military adventurism uh, in the Crimea, uh, Crimea and uh, Ukraine. Uh, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter this week picked one of those three, and he has said Russia was the, basically the most important national security threat, sort of reorienting the defense and the challenges to that. Uh, do you agree with his decision? No, I don't. I worry, uh, I ver worry very, very much about an isolated country. That's what makes me nervous. Russia lives in the world. China lives in the world. North Korea is a very, very strange country because it is so isolated. And I do fear that a nation with, uh, with nuclear weapons, uh, they have got to be dealt with and dealt with effectively. Secretary Clinton, what do you think of uh, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter? He's basically putting Russia above Iran, above North Korea, as sort of the chief national security challenge right now? Well, I haven't talked to, uh, talked to Secretary uh, Carter, but here's what I uh, would think he's uh, uh, planning. You know, we do have the nuclear weapons agreement with Iran. That's an enforcement consequence, action for action, follow on. We have a plan, we will watch them, we will be vigilant. We do have to worry about North Korea. They continue to develop their nuclear weapons capability and they are working very hard on their ballistic missile capability. And I know that some of those uh, plans could very well lead to a missile that might reach Hawaii, if not the West Coast. And we do have to try to get the countries in the region to work with us to do everything we can to confine and constrain them. But what Secretary Carter is looking at is the constant 
pressure that Russia is putting on our European allies, the way that Russia is trying to move the boundaries of the post-World War II Europe, the way they, he is trying to set European countries against one another, seizing territory, holding it in Crimea, beginning to explore whether they could make some inroads in the Baltics. We know that they are deeply engaged in supporting Assad uh, because they want to have a place in the Middle East. They have a naval uh, base. They have an air base in Syria. They want to hang on to that. And I think what Secretary Carter is seeing, and I'm glad he is, is that we've got to get NATO back working for the common defense. We've got to do more to support our partners in NATO, and we have to send a very clear message to Putin that this kind of belligerence, this kind of testing of okay. boundaries will have to be responded to. And the best way to do that is put more armor in, put okay. more uh, money from the Europeans in, so they're Thank actually uh, contributing more to their own defense. Thank you both. Rachel. Secretary Clinton, I want to ask you about a national security issue that is closer to home. Uh, there are thousands of veterans, over 100,000 veterans, living in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, either one of you is nominated as the Democratic Party's nominee. You will likely face a Republican opponent in the general election who wants to privatize or even abolish big parts of the VA. It's a newly popular idea in conservative politics. How will you win the argument on that issue, given the problems that have been exposed at the VA in the last few years? What's your argument that the VA should still exist and should not be privatized? Well, first of all, I am absolutely against privatizing the VA, and I am going to do everything I can to build on the reforms that uh, Senator Sanders and others in Congress have uh, passed to try to fix what's wrong with the VA. There are a lot of uh, issues about wait times and services that have to be fixed because our veterans deserve nothing but the best. But you're absolutely right. You know, Rachel, this is another part of the Koch brothers' agenda. They've actually formed an organization to try to begin to convince Americans we should no longer have guaranteed health care, specialized care for our veterans. I will fight that as hard as I can. I think there's where we can enlist the veteran service organizations, the veterans of America, because yes, let's fix the VA, but we will never let it be privatized. Good. And that is a promise. You, as a, as a congressional leader on veterans' issues in the Veterans Committee, uh, yeah. you've worked in a very bipartisan way with Senator John McCain and others on veterans' issues. Right. Is that the right contour of the fight? The way well, she's let me talking agree. about this uh, issue. You know, as the secretary knows, I, I, chaired, I had the privilege and the honor of chairing the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs. Um, and it is interesting to me, you know, Republicans give a lot of speeches about how much they love veterans. Uh, I work with the American Legion, the VFW, the DAV, the Vietnam Vets, and virtually every veterans organization to put together the most comprehensive piece of veterans legislation in the modern history of America. That's what I did. And I brought it to the floor of the Senate. Every Democrat voted for, every Democrat voted for it. I got two Republicans. We ended up with 56 votes, and I couldn't get the 60 votes that I needed. That is pathetic. This was legislation supported by all of the veterans' organizations addressing many of the serious problems that veterans face in health care and in how we deliver benefits to them. So Republicans talk a good game about veterans, but when it came to put money on the line to protect our veterans, frankly, they were not there. What I did next, Rachel, is I had to retreat a little bit. I had to compromise. I did work with John McCain. I did work with Jeff Miller over in the House. And we put together not the bill that I wanted, but probably the most comprehensive uh, VA health care bill in the modern history of this country. Secretary Clinton is absolutely right. There are people, Koch brothers among others, who have a group called Concerned Veterans of America, funded by the Koch brothers. Koch brothers, by the way, who want to destroy Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, every governmental program passed since the 1930s. Yeah, there are people out there who want to privatize it. Last point that I'd make, I had a hearing. I had all of the veterans groups in front of me, and I said to them, tell me, 
When a veteran gets in to the VA, understanding there are waiting lines and real problems. When a veteran gets into the system, is the quality of care good? Without exception, what they said, good, excellent, very good. We've got to strengthen the VA. We do not Thank privatize you, the VA. Senator Sanders, Secretary Clinton, we're going to take another break. We'll be talking about Social Security and some of those other issues when we come back. We're going to get into a little bit of uh, election politics, electability a little bit. Senator Sanders, the Iowa Democratic Party has declared Hillary Clinton the winner of Monday's Iowa caucuses, narrowest of margins. Today, the Des Moines Register has an editorial that calls for an audit of the results saying, quote, what happened Monday night at the Democratic caucuses was a debacle, period. The results were too close not to do a complete audit. Senator Sanders, do you accept the idea that Hillary Clinton won Iowa? And do you or do you believe the caucuses are still an open question? Well, I agree with the Des Moines Register, but let's not blow this out of proportion. This is not a this is not like a winner take all thing. I think where we now stand, correct me if I'm wrong, you have 22 delegates. I have 20 delegates. We need uh, 2,500 delegates to win the nomination. <laughs> you know, so this is not this is not the biggest deal in the world. We think, by the way, based on talking to our precinct captains, we may have at least two more delegates. What the Des Moines Register said, you know, there were coin flips, I think there were half a dozen coin flips, a fairly uh, chaotic type of situation. At the end of the day, no matter how it's recounted, it will break roughly even. And by the way, I love and respect the caucus process in Iowa. Uh, see, and I don't have to say it because they voted already. <laughs> New Hampshire too, because you haven't voted, but, but look, I think people are blowing this up out of proportion, but I think we need improvements in uh, the process by which results are determined. Secretary Clinton, will you participate in some sort of audit if that's what the party wants to do? You good with that? Uh, you know, whatever they decide to do, that's fine. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Okay. All right. Good. We go. move on. Uh, We're happy with that. Senator, we got more questions. Senator Sanders, um, in 1964. Oh, word. <laughs> See, when you are old, then they go back all these years. All right, what do you got? In 1964, I heard that the Republicans nominated uh, Barry Goldwater, who was the hero of the conservative movement. He was, however, far to the right of uh, most of that party. In 1972, the Democrats nominated George McGovern, who was a hero of liberals and the anti-war movement, but he was to the left of his party's mainstream. Both of those nominees made activists very excited and they both got destroyed in the general election right. even democrats who love you worry about your fate in a general election and i know you have good head-to-head -head polling numbers against republican front runners right now we know that but do you have a general election strategy that is di that is different than the way you're running right now to try to get the nomination well you know a general election is different than a primary and caucus process but let me just say this, in terms of where we are right now, as you've mentioned, Rachel, in a number of national and state, including New Hampshire, uh, for example, the last poll I saw, there may have been a new one, last one I saw here in New Hampshire, a battleground state had me defeating Trump by 19, the secretary defeating him by one. There were also pretty large margins in Iowa and Wisconsin. These are polls, polls go up, polls go down. But here's why I think, I will be, if nominated, the strongest candidate. Democrats win when there is a large voter turnout, when people are excited, when working people, middle class people, and young people are prepared to engage in the political process. Republicans win when people are demoralized and you have a small voter turnout, which, by the way, is why they love voter suppression. I believe that our campaign up to now has shown that we can create an enormous amount of enthusiasm from working people, from young people, who will get involved in the political process and which will drive us to a very large voter turnout. If there is a large voter turnout, not only do we retain the White House, but I think we regain the Senate, we win governor's chairs up and down the line. So I believe if you want to retain the White House, if you want to see Democrats do well across the board, I think our campaign is the one that creates the large voter turnout and helps us win. Secretary Clinton, your campaign and surrogates and people who have endorsed you 
have suggested that or even said that if Senator Sanders is the nominee, that Democrats will suffer nationwide and the chances will go down of Democrats holding on to the White House. With him here standing next to you, can you tell us whether or not you believe he would win the general election if he were nominated? I can only tell you what uh, I believe, and that is that I am the strongest candidate to uh, take it to the Republicans and win in November. And I, I say that with great, re with great respect for the campaign that Senator Sanders has been running. I personally am thrilled at the numbers of people, and particularly young people, who are coming to support your campaign. I hope that I will be able to earn their support. I, they may not support me now, but I support them and we'll work together. But what I'm concerned about is the views of many Democrats who know their states, who know how hard it is to win a general election. And it also will put whoever the nominee is into the spotlight. I've been vetted. There's hardly anything you don't know about me. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that whoever is in that position, uh, Senator Sanders or anyone else who might have run, will face the most withering onslaught. So I think that I am the person who can do all aspects of the job. Uh, I think I'm the person best prepared to take the case to the Republicans. And I think that at the end of the day, it's not so much electability, it is who the American people can believe, can keep them safe, can get the economy moving again, can get incomes rising, can build on the progressive accomplishments of President Obama. And I think that the coalition that President Obama put together to win twice is a coalition that I can put together and add to. And right. that's thank what thank I'm prepared you. for. Thank you, uh, I wanna, we're going to keep on, we're staying on this we're issue. Stay on this we're staying on this topic with Secretary Clinton. Just like there are some Democrats that question um, Senator Sanders' ability in the general election, many Democratic voters that our reporters have been running into in Iowa and New Hampshire, they tell <laughs> our reporters over and over again they're worried about the emails issue. Not because they don't believe your explanation, but because it's a drip drip, because the cloud is hanging over your head and that it will impact the general election. They see your numbers right now and they think it's the email issue as to why you're not polling very well. So can you reassure these Democrats that somehow the email issue isn't gonna blow up your candidacy if you're the nominee? Absolutely I can. You know, before it was emails, it was Benghazi. And the Republicans uh, were stirring up uh, so much uh, uh, controversy about that. And I testified for 11 hours, answered their questions. They basically said, yep. Didn't get her, we tried. That was all a political ploy. Now we had a development in the email matter today when it came out that Secretary Powell and close aides to former Secretary Rice uh, used private email accounts. And now you have these people in the government who are doing the same thing to Secretary Powell and Secretary Rice's aides they've been doing to me, which is that I never sent or received any classified material. They are retroactively classifying it. I agree completely with Secretary Powell, who said today, this is an absurdity. And so I think the American people will know it's an absurdity. I have absolutely no concerns about it whatsoever. All right, Madam Secretary, though, there, there is an open, there is an open FBI investigation into this matter about how you may have handled classified material. Are you 100% confident that nothing is going to come of this FBI investigation? I am 100% confident. This is a security review that was requested. It is being carried out. It will be resolved. But I have to add, if there's going to be a security review about me, there's going to have to be security reviews about a lot of other people, including Republican office holders, because we've got this absurd situation of retroactive classifications. Honest to goodness, this is this just beggars the imagination. So I have absolutely no concerns about it. But 
We've got to get to the bottom of what's really going on here, and I hope that will happen. Well, Senator Sanders, you uh, famously at the first debate said you, d you didn't give a darn about her uh, emails. I think well, you used another quote. <laughs> You're right. I, I'm trying to. It's a, fa it, family, it's a, fa it's a family hour still right now. <laughs> After 11 o'clock, I'll say it the other way. Um, and you mostly have refrained from commenting on it, but recently you called it a very serious issue. And then the other day you said, well, she's getting slapped with the email controversy. Uh, are, are you, how are you feeling about these dar, darn feeling, emails now? I am feeling exactly the way I felt at the first debate. There's a process on the way. I will not politicize it. Okay. Senator Sanders. Senator, thank you. And by the way, and by the way, if I may, well, the secretary probably doesn't know that there's not a day that goes by why I am, when I am not asked to attack her on that issue, and I have refrained from doing that, and I will continue to refrain from doing that. Senator Sanders, thank you. Senator, in December, one of your campaign staffers was fired from your campaign for taking voter data, essentially, from the Clinton campaign. You apologized for that when the incident was made public. Uh, your campaign has now been criticized for its operatives, essentially impersonating culinary union members wearing union pins in Nevada. Um, and the Nashua Telegraph has complained recently that you falsely implied in an advertisement that they had endorsed you when they did not. None of these issues, obviously, is the end of the world, but they all are of a piece. Are, are you, in some sense, losing control of your campaign? Not losing control of our campaign. You know, we have hired a whole lot of people uh, in a rapid way, and I am familiar with the first two instances, and they are uh, unacceptable. And we have apologized and dealt with that. Uh, in terms of the last one, uh, as I understand it, uh, we did not suggest that we had the endorsement of a newspaper. Uh, newspapers who make endorsements also say positive things about other candidates. And to the best of my knowledge, that is what we did. So we never said, never said that somebody, a newspaper endorsed us that did not. What we did say is, blah, 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 was said by the newspaper. Just to follow up on that, the title of the ad in question was endorsement. But the, uh, that was only for, that was not to be on television. That's, that's, that's an true. important point. That was just something, <laughs> as the secretary knows, you put titles on ads and you send them out. But there was no word in that ad, none that said that those new newspapers had endorsed us. Secretary Clinton, do you want 30 seconds on this issue? No. All right. <laughs> and with that, we will take, right, we'll take a break. We'll be right Welcome back to the University of New Hampshire in the Democratic Candidates debate. Uh, Secretary Clinton, on the issue of the death penalty. Here in New Hampshire, the one person who is on death row is there for killing a police officer. It's a crime that has caused anguish in this state, both among death penalty opponents and death penalty supporters. The last time I had the chance to talk with you on this issue on the death penalty, you said that capital punishment has a place in a very few federal cases, but you also said you would breathe a sigh of relief if the Supreme Court abolished the death penalty nationwide. Tonight, do you still support capital punishment even if you do so reluctantly? Yes, I do. And, you know, what I hope the Supreme Court will do uh, is make it absolutely clear that any state that continues capital punishment either must meet the highest standards of evidentiary proof of effective assistance of counsel or they cannot continue it because that to me is the real dividing line I have much more uh, confidence in the federal system and I do reserve it for particularly heinous crimes in the federal system like terrorism uh, I have strong feelings about that I thought it was appropriate after a very thorough trial that uh, Timothy McVeigh uh, received the death penalty for blowing up the federal building in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people, including 19 children in a daycare center. So I do, for very limited, particularly heinous crimes, believe it is an appropriate punishment. But I deeply disagree with the way that too many states still are implementing it. So if it were possible,
possible to separate out the federal from the state system by the Supreme Court, that would, I think, be an appropriate outcome. Senator Sanders, you have singled out the death penalty and Senator Clinton's support for the death penalty as an issue that makes it hard to consider her a progressive well, in your mind. But look, I, I hear what the secretary ahead, said, and, and I understand that. Look, there are all of us know uh, that we have seen in recent years horrible, horrible, horrible crimes. Uh, and it's hard to imagine how people can do bomb and kill 168 people in Oklahoma City or do the Boston Marathon bombing. But this is what I believe, and, and for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, too many innocent people, including minorities, African Americans, uh, have been executed uh, when they were not guilty. That's number one. So we have to be very careful about making sure about that. But second of all, and maybe in a deeper reason, of course there are barbaric acts out there, but in a world of so much violence and killing, I just don't believe that government itself should be part of the killing. So when somebody commits, when somebody commits any of these terrible crimes that we have seen, you lock them up and you toss away the key. They're never going to get out. But I just don't want to see government be part of killing. That's all. But another issue related to the proper role of government, and in, in this case, specifically the role of government between the federal government and the states. I want to talk for a moment about the issue of Flint, Michigan. On the Flint lead poisoning disaster, you have both been highly critical of Governor Rick Snyder of Michigan and how the state in Michigan both caused the lead poisoning problem and has not acted fast enough to fix it. You have both been outspoken on that. The fact is Michigan, though, has not fixed it. There is no door-to-door -door delivery of clean water in Flint even today. Not a single lead pipe has been replaced in Flint even today. If the state is failing, would you, Secretary Clinton, would you as president order a federal response to get it right over and above the wishes of the state? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Rachel, you and I have talked about this before. I thank you for going to Flint to hold that town hall. I will be in Flint at the mayor's invitation on Sunday to get a in-depth briefing about what is and is not happening. This is an emergency. Every day that goes by that these people, particularly the children, are not tested so we can know what steps must be taken to try to remediate the effects of the poisoning that they have been uh, living with is a day lost in a child's life. And I know from the work that I've done over so many years, lead, the toxic nature of lead, can affect your brain development, your body development, your behavior. So I absolutely believe that what is being done is not sufficient. We need to be absolutely clear about everything that should be done from today to tomorrow into the future to try to remedy the terrible burden that the people of Flint are bearing. And that includes fixing their pipes. It includes guaranteeing whatever health care and educational uh, embellishments they may need going forward. Uh, and I think the federal government has ways where it can build the state of Michigan. If Michigan won't do it, there have to be ways that we can begin to move and then make them pay for it and hold them accountable. Senator Sanders. The federal government could be doing. President Obama could be ordering done right now in Flint, Michigan, that are not being done. That U.S. president would do. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think the secretary described the situation appropriately. Uh, you know, I I don't go around asking for governors' resignations every day. In fact, I think I never have in my life. But I did ask for the resignation of Governor Snyder because his irresponsibility was so outrageous. What we are talking about are children being poisoned. That's what we're talking about. We don't know, no one knows for sure, because they haven't even done the appropriate studies. But there's no question that kids' uh, intellectual development may have been impacted. We don't know how many thousands. The idea that there has not been a dramatic response is beyond comprehension. And when you have one of the, I think, significant public health crises of recent years, of course the federal government comes in. And of course the federal government says, you're not going to be poisoning uh, little kids and impacting their entire lives. Last point on this. 
And I suspect the secretary agrees. One wonders if this were a white suburban community, what kind of response there would have been. Flint, Michigan, Flint, Michigan is a poor community. It is disproportionately African-American and minority. And what has happened there is absolutely unacceptable. Senator, All right. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Clinton, let me turn to the issue of trade. In the 90s, you supported NAFTA, but you opposed it when you ran for president in 2008. As Secretary of State, you supported TPP, and then, uh, which of course is that trade agreement with a lot of Asian countries, but you now oppose it as you make your second bid for president. If elected, should Democrats expect that once you're in office, you will then become supportive of these trade agreements again? You know, Chuck, I've only had responsibility for uh, voting for trade agreements as a senator. And I voted against a multinational trade agreement when I was a senator, the CAFTA agreement, uh, because I did not believe it was in the best interests of uh, the workers of America, of our incomes, and I opposed it. I did hope that the TPP negotiated by this administration would put to rest a lot of the concerns that many people have expressed about trade agreements. And I said that I was holding out that hope that it would be uh, the kind of trade agreement that I was looking for. I waited until it had actually been negotiated because I did want to give the benefit of the doubt to the administration. Once I saw what the uh, outcome was, I opposed it. Now, I have a very clear view about this. We have to trade with the rest of the world. We are 5% of the world's population. We have to trade with the other 95%. And trade has to be reciprocal. That's the way the global economy works. But we have failed to provide the basic safety net support that American workers need in order to be able to compete and win in the global economy. So it's not just what's in the trade agreement that I'm interested in. Uh, I did help to renegotiate the trade agreement that we inherited from uh, President uh, Bush with Korea. We got the uh, UAW on board because of changes we made. So there are changes that I believe would make a real difference if they could be achieved, but I do not currently support it as it is written. Well, Senator Sanders, I know you want to respond on this. You have never supported a trade deal That's since right. you've been in Congress. Absolutely. But if right. you do that as president, if you do that as president, how are you not essentially letting China, who will do all of these deals around the world, how are you going to prevent China from Chuck. essentially setting the rules Chuck. of trade for the world? Chuck, I believe in trade, but I do not believe in unfettered free trade. I believe in fair trade, which works for the middle class and working families of this country and not just large multinational corporations. I was not only in opposition to NAFTA, and this is an area where the Secretary and I have disagreements. I was not only in opposition to NAFTA, I was on the picket line in opposition to NAFTA. Because I understood, I don't think this is really rocket science. We heard all of the people tell us how many great jobs would be created. I didn't believe that for a second. Because I understood what the function of NAFTA, CAFTA, PNTR with China, and the TPP is is to say to American workers, hey, you are now competing against people in Vietnam who make 56 cents an hour minimum wage. I don't want American workers to compete against people <coughs> making 56 cents an hour. I don't want companies shutting down in America, throwing people out on the street, moving to China, and bringing their products back into this country. So, do I believe in trade? Of course I believe in trade. But the current trade agreements over the last 30 years were written by corporate America, for corporate America, resulted in the loss of millions of decent paying jobs, 60,000 factories in America lost since 2001, millions of decent paying jobs, and also a downward spiral, a race to the bottom, where employers say, hey, you don't want to take a cut in pay? We're going to China. Workers today are working longer hours for low wages. Trade is one of the reasons for that. All right. Thank you both. We're going to sneak in one more break here. And when we come back, we'll come back here in the final minutes. Uh, home this, stretch. Home stretch of this 
only Democratic debate in the final week before the primary. Let me start with you, Secretary Clinton, on this question. Obviously, President Obama got a lot of ambitious stuff done in his first year and a half. You're going to have to make choices, and there's a lot of heavy lifts, and he made choices. He did health care, and it came at the expense, arguably, of immigration reform. <clears throat> Had he put immigration reform first, perhaps that gets done, and health care doesn't. So there's three big lifts that you've talked about. Immigration, gun reform, climate change. What do you do first? Because you know the first one is the one you have the best shot at getting done. Well, I, I don't accept that premise, Chuck. I think that uh, we've got so much business we have to do. We've talked a lot of tonight about what we're against. We're against income inequality. We're against the abuses of powerful interests. We're against a lot of things. I'm for a lot of things. I don't want to just stop bad things from happening. I want to start good things from happening. And I believe, if I'm so fortunate as to get the nomination, I will begin to work immediately on putting together an agenda, beginning to talk with members of Congress and others about how we can push forward. I want to have half a billion more solar panels deployed uh, the first four years. I want to have enough clean energy to power every home the next four years. I want us to keep working on the Affordable Care Act to get not only to 100% coverage, but bring down the cost of prescription drugs and out-of-pocket costs. I want to move forward on paid family leave, on early childhood education. I want us to do more for small businesses. Small businesses have to create most of the jobs, and we're not creating and growing small businesses. I think if you have a smart agenda, you pick the committees that you know have to begin to work on these various pieces because that's the way Congress is set up. You go through different committees, and you really make a big push in the the beginning, immigration reform, economic revitalization with manufacturing, with uh, infrastructure. We put it out there and we begin to work on an ambitious, big, bold right. agenda that will actually produce the results that I want to see for our country. All right, but Senator Sanders, you still got to do something first. As you know, I, I, history, history shows what you pick first is your best shot at getting and how you prioritize things. No, let, let Immigration me, reform, for instance, fell by the wayside in the I first term because of I am absolutely supportive of comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship for 11 million people today who are living in the shadows. All right, we got to do that. But you missed, when you looked at the issues, you missed two of the most important. And that is you're not going to accomplish what has to be done for working families and the middle class unless there is campaign finance reform. So long as big money interests control the United States Congress, it is gonna be very hard to do what has to be done for working families. So let me be very clear. No nominee of mine, if I am elected president, to the United States Supreme Court will get that nomination unless he or she is loud and clear and says they will vote to overturn Citizens United. <laughs> second, point, second point is that the only way we make change in terms of health care, in terms of dealing with a broken criminal justice system which today allows us to have more people in jail than any other country, largely African-American and Latino. The only way we create millions of jobs by rebuilding our infrastructure or have a tax system that says to the wealthy that they are gonna pay their fair share is when millions of people become involved in the political process. No, you just can't negotiate with Mitch McConnell. Mitch is gonna to have to look out the window and see a whole lot of people saying, Mitch, stop representing the billionaire class. Start listening to working Secretary families. Secretary. And as president, that's what I will work hard on. Okay, thank you. Rachel. Secretary Clinton. Republicans, particularly uh, in campaign years, often talk about which departments of government, which agencies of government they would get rid of if they were elected president. The EPA, the Department of Education, the Commerce Department, oops. Is, is there a department of government that you would get rid of? Or is there a whole new one that you would create? <laughs> the answer to both of those is no. I'm interested in making what we have work better. I want to streamline uh, programs that are duplicative and redundant. I want to have a top to bottom review about what works and what doesn't work and be absolutely clear we're getting rid of what doesn't work. 
I have had the opportunity to run uh, a big agency. I was very flattered when Henry Kissinger said I ran the State Department better than, better than anybody had run it in a long time. So I have an idea about what it's going to take to make our government work more efficiently. And when you put together a budget, you have to make a lot of hard decisions. But I think it's not appropriate to say, oh, I'm going to get rid of this, get rid of that, until you have a very good process that gives you the information about what to do. But I, I want to add something else, you know, because, look, we have so much work to do in our country, and I think it's the greatest work that Americans will be called to do. And of course we have to have people in every community involved in it. We have to have the political voice, the political grassroots speaking up and speaking out about what we have to try to accomplish in Washington. But we also need to have a very clear set of goals that we are going to achieve. And we need to level with the American people about what they are, what they will cost, what will be expected of our citizenry. So I see as president, having a constant dialogue with Americans. Here's what we're trying to get done. Here's why I need your help. Here's why you may think comprehensive immigration reform with a path to citizenship isn't something you Thank care you. about, but I'm telling you, it will help fix the labor market. It will bring people out of the shadows. You, it Secretary will actually Clinton. raise wages. You have to make all those connections so that you've got people with you That's every time. step of the way. Thank That's what much. I want to do. Thank you. All right, before we go, we want to ask each one of these. Secretary Clinton, you've made it clear that when you look at Senator Sanders, you do not see a president. But do I you see said that. do you see a vice president? <laughs> look. Would you unite the party by uh, by trying to uh, pick Senator Sanders as your running mate? Well, I'm certainly going to unite the party, but I'm not I'm not getting ahead of myself. I think that would be a little bit uh, presumptuous. If I'm so fortunate as to be the nominee, first person I will call to talk to about where we go and how we get it done will be Senator Sanders. Senator, would you consider the Secretary? Uh, I agree with what the Secretary said. We shouldn't be uh, getting ahead of ourselves. And as I have said many times, you know, sometimes in these campaigns, things get a little bit out of hand. <laughs> I happen to respect the Secretary very much. I hope it's mutual. Uh, and. Uh, on our worst days, I think it is fair to say, we are a hundred times better than any Republican candidate. Uh, Secretary Clinton, closing statements, you are first. Well, first, thanks to MSNBC and thanks to all of you uh, for holding this debate before the New Hampshire primary. I am going to campaign as hard as I can between now and Tuesday uh, to earn your votes in that primary. And I hear some talk that people are trying to decide, do they vote with their heart, do they vote with their head? I'm asking you to bring both your heart and your head to vote with you on Tuesday. <laughs> because we have a lot of work that can only come because your heart is moved. You know, we didn't get to talk about the continuing struggles that Americans face with racism, with sexism, with discrimination against the LGBT community, with new Americans, with people with disabilities. Yes, we have income inequality, we have other forms of inequality that we need to stand up against and absolutely diminish from our society. So I have been moved by my heart ever since I was a young woman, about the age of a lot of Senator Sanders supporters, worrying about what I could do to make a difference for my country, and I will bring that heart with me, but I will also tell you, we've got to get our heads together to come up with the best answers to solve the problems so that people can have have real differences in their lives that will make them better for now and into the future. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Go ahead, Senator Sanders. Um, uh, I, my dad uh, came to this country at the age of 17 from Poland. I didn't have any money, couldn't speak English. Uh, he died pretty young, and I think it would have been beyond his wildest dreams to see his son up here on the stage today running for president. I love this country, and my dad loved this country, and he was the most 
proud American because of what it gave him in terms of raising his family, even though we never had much money. But today in America, we are the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people, that doesn't guarantee paid family and medical leave. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. We are seeing millions of families unable to send their kids to college in the United States of America. I'm running for president because I believe it is just too late for establishment politics and establishment economics. I do believe we need a political revolution where millions of people stand up and say loudly and clearly that our government belongs to all of us and not just a handful of wealthy campaign contributors. Thank you all. you, Rachel and I have a lot more questions, but we just don't have any more time, unless we can convince them to do a third hour, but I don't think so. Our debate coverage, post-debate coverage, will continue in just a moment with our colleague Chris Matthews, but we want to thank all of you for being here, and we want to thank the two candidates for taking part in this important event. We also want to thank our host, the University of New Hampshire, uh, and the people of New Hampshire. You guys get to vote in just five days. We can't wait to see how it turns out. Don't screw it up. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Chris Matthews, and we've been watching it. I think it's an extraordinary night in American politics. The first and only one-on-one -on -one debate between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders leading up to the New Hampshire primary next Tuesday night. Well, the results will be next Tuesday night. At times tonight, it got heated.